All right, everybody. Well, good to have you all with us. This is uh, a great big welcome for our 101st session of the Coronavirus Multi-Species Reading Group. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, today, uh, Eben and I are kind of swapping hot seats here because we've invited him to um, speak about his fabulous new essay, um, which is part of Emanuele Cocha's Unknown Unknowns, an introduction to mysteries for the Milano Triennale. So I'm wondering, um, as we, we get rolling today and talking about this wonderful piece, um, if we could just talk a little bit about the, the theme, unknown unknowns. Um, and Eben, I know that you were with us uh, in Milano fairly recently in, in May um, uh, for, for a panel as well. But um, Coccia here in Italy, I mean, is, is a well-known Italian philosopher you know, has written Metamorphosi, has written La Vita del Cante, um, among other texts. And, you know, I'm curious if you could give us some background to this unknown unknowns theme. Um, what were some of the, um, what were some of the other, you know, explorations of this? Um, tell us a little bit about maybe that, your latest panel dialogue that was here. Just give us, maybe set up the landscape of your recent experience um, here. Sure. So um, uh, I also want to give a shout out to Julieta Aranda, who has just joined. So Julieta uh, was together with me uh, in Milan, I guess, what, now a month ago, where we had a public dialogue with Beth Povinelli. Um, and broadly, we were talking about the undead, although we didn't talk so much directly on, on, on viruses. Um, so yeah, I haven't seen the the triennial yet. I think it opens very soon. Um, but yeah, this this uh, essay is part of the the catalog that goes along with with the exhibit. And um, yeah, when they reached out to me, they asked me to write something on on Gaia. Um, and I had a little bit to say on on Gaia, although um, you know, for for the reasons that I try to un unravel in, in this essay. Uh, in, in many ways, I think that that metaphor falls apart when you push at it too hard in terms of a coherent entity um, sort of overseeing the health and well-being of the planetary ecologies. Um, you know, I think kind of uh, e even at the le level of an ecosystem, um, sort of uh, figures of, of organismic holes kind of fall apart when you push at them too much. So as, as I reread the piece for today, I, I realized it's um, it's about the, the virus here, you know, the totality of viruses, but, but also I guess it's kind of um, uh, a summary of what I know about the human virome, uh, what I've learned largely through conversations um, with this this reading group, um, in particular, uh, Sasha Gorbelenia, who might join us in a little bit, and, and Forrest Roher and Jeremy Barr, who've all been guests. And, and I guess, yeah, uh, for me, engaging with this theme about uh, the unknown unknown, which is the theme of, of the triennial exhibit, um, yeah, it's, you know, echoes of Donald Rumsfeld, but also just trying to think about um, the unfigurable. Um, you could, uh, you know, invoke Derrida here. So, so Derrida um, was was very interested in, in things that can't be imagined. Uh, he was doing, and here's a, a conversation that Astor and I have had for more than a decade about about Derrida and what 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 the horizons of imagination look like. Um, so, so yeah, Derrida was was um, interested in things that are ever beyond the imaginative horizon, at least in terms of thinking about futurity. And uh, yeah, here, here I was trying to think about living figures that um, are enabling, constraining, detouring, rerouting human modes of life, but also broader uh, uh, possibilities of life uh, within um, the oceans and within the planetary ecologies that we all share. Um, so yeah, I guess in my earlier writing, I've pushed against Derrida uh, uh, to sort of invoke the specificity of figuration and thinking about the future. And, and I guess I'd, I'd do so in, in this context as well. And thinking about the unknown unknowns, I think approaching uh, the universe of, of the unknown, we've got to grasp at those, those things that are barely perceptible, that are kind of at the, the margins of our 
ability to kind of stabilize and um, uh, you know whether that stabilization is is uh, taking the form of visualization, which doesn't quite work so well with viruses, or genomics or bioinformatics. Um, so so how how do we do that work? Um, maybe in the broader field of multi species studies, the art of noticing. Um, I think there's some particular challenges in the biosphere, and and those are the ones that I was trying to tackle in this piece. Thanks, Adrian. Um... You know, I was thinking that, you know, over the course of this um, global pandemic, you've, uh, you know, had a number of pieces come out. I'm just wondering um, the trajectory of that work over the over the course of this global experience. You know, how has that how has this shifted? How has that how has this piece maybe how does this piece re reflect a shift in that broader landscape of the, the work that you've been you know, doing just just over the over the the pandemic, and we're thinking back to kind of the earliest phases of this reading group too, where you you presented one of your your earlier pieces there. So just you know, how does this fit? How do you see it fitting into the broader trajectory of just what you've the excellent pieces you've come up with during the pandemic? Yeah, I, I remember you know very early in the pandemic, and this was in part at Emma Koval's invitation. Um, just just thinking about what this moment might tell us about the Anthropocene, and you know, since since then we've we've had some really great work, including Jamie Lorimer's uh, 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 presentation last week or last last time around about the anthropods, and I think some really fascinating work has been done, you know, specifically on this virus, SARS-CoV-2, and and how it's kind of interrupted um, human activities on a planetary scale. But you know this this piece is is maybe panning out uh, and and trying to step back from Anthropos and step back from um, you know it's it's concerned with the human again you know kind of the human virome but also trying to think um, about the human virome in the context of uh, yeah viruses that are largely indifferent to our existence. Um, so yeah, I guess it's trying to decenter the anthropos from from stories uh, about um, yeah contemporary uh, uh, yeah disruptions and and in shared planetary life. You so going along with that, you talked about the the world forming capacities of non non humans in this piece, and um, maybe walk us through some of these um, presumptions about the human world that get. This disruptive that you're trying to kind of um, poke at in this piece, you know, and 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 some of the ways in which the virosphere, you know, and, and learning about the virosphere interrupts some of those neat presumptions about human nature and those kind of static biological and genetically determined facts. Um, um, tell us a little bit about that in this piece. Yeah, in, in many ways, this is my old shtick, <laughs> and uh, you know, in in some some ways, I kind of lifted ideas and even paragraphs from emerging ecologies. So, this this argument with Heidegger and Sloterdijk, um, you know, about whether the human is exceptional or not, go, goes back in, in my thinking uh, at, at least a decade. And and I should say that you know, at first I fell in love with Sloterdijk. You know, Sloterdijk has written this this set of really playful um interventions you know at a time when many people were starting to talk about Jakob von Uxbull's Umwelt you know the environmental world the the world of bounded perception and action I found that Sloterdijk was one of the only thinkers who was really playing with that idea and pushing it and pulling it in in new directions but but still at <clears throat> kind of the foundation of of um Sloterdijk's philosophical treatise is that somehow the human is radically different from from you know uh, these other kinds of life that are ontologically bound in a cage? You know, the, the human is the only creature moving up, uh, amongst ontologies um, that's building and destroying worlds. And in emerging ecologies, I, I was um, sort of taking Sloterdijk's ideas and running with them. Um, with the help of uh, a pandemic fungus, uh, something called uh, Bacopochytrium dendrobatidis, or the chytrid fungus, uh, which is talking about a whole broad group of organisms. And, you know, chytrids are bubbles within bubbles. They're, they're building worlds. They're also destroying the worlds of amphibians. 
And, you know, I, I was basically trying to take that same idea and run with it here in the realm of viruses. And uh, yeah, I, I think um, in, in some ways I, I liked chytrids because they were marginal, they were liminal, they were, um, you know, not, not really directly um, in any way sort of a, a, a mainstream figure in terms of what people are thinking or concerned with. But but I think you know the viral story is is much bigger than the chytrid story, and um, it, I, I think it it interrupts um, yeah human agency and in action in some really interesting ways and ways that um, kind of get at uh, what earlier theorists of human nature imagined to be the essence of you know human biology or human nature, and this is where the retrotransposons, the the jumping genes, the so-called junk DNA. Um, really interrupt what we might take to be um, a stable basis of, of, of humanity. But, but I think, yeah, the viral story um, also decenters and destabilizes um, these, these ideas of, of human exceptionalism. As, as, as we also try to think about, yeah, the, the, the ways that these, these um, infectious agents are, are constantly kind of um, testing, testing our limits, testing our receptors, testing our immune system, testing, um, testing the waters, in, in the words of um, some of these phage biologists, to, to see if they might find a foothold in, in an organism and, and kind of turn that organism to their, to their own ends. So, so, so I think this, this idea of kind of a, a, a compromised body, uh, a, a, an organism whose purposes aren't always its own, you know, th these are these are some of the ideas that I'm trying to explore in this piece. And if anyone, um, if anyone wants to jump in, please just use. Oh, there we go. Yeah, um, Cesar, you had your hand up. Yep. Um, thank you so much. That was a great piece. I enjoyed it very much. Kind of pushing you on on that line. Uh, would you would you think that in the same line that if you push the Gaia? Um, notion, think of something coherent, does thinking about virus also kind of make a personhood in the Western sense, in the Thomistic sense, collapse? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I, uh, and I might try to answer that with Lacan, not that I'm a very good Lacanian, but uh, yeah, I, I, th I think um, if, if we think about ourselves not as, again, kind of a unified subject, as, as a, a subject that's, that's divided, as um, a subject that isn't entirely aware of the various kind of processes that are going on, whether those processes are cognitive, um, you know, about a, a, a mental subjectivity or interiority, or whether those processes are the distributed processes that I gesture to, you know, in conversation with John Dupre and Stephen Goodinger and, and Sasha Gorbelenia, you know, the, the sort of parallel processes that are happening um, uh, in, in ways that are barely perceptible. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think um, at, the, at the same time, so your question was about Gaia and, you know, here I'm kind of using the Gaia metaphor a little bit, but, but pushing at it and, and showing where it breaks down. So, so, so yeah, I think, you know, perhaps this idea of, of a unified subject um, is, is something that we can decenter with the virus. Um, but, but I think there's always the, mis, the, 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 uh, the possibility of misplaced concreteness that kind of the viral explains everything. And um, so, so in thinking about the decentered human subject of today, you know, I'm also thinking about, you know, virality in the d domain of, of, of media cultures. Um, I'm thinking about the ways that, you know, human subjectivity and personhood is mediated by digital technologies like we're talking on right now, not to mention the sort of everyday social interactions that exist alongside or, or predate, um, you know, the internet. So, so, so I think there's a lot of different ways that we can decenter um, human personhood, and the virus helps with that. Um, but, but I would caution myself and anyone else to not just focus on on the virus, but to to think about the multiply mediated ways that um, our sense of self 
our sense of ourselves as organisms, as thinking, thinking subjects, as subjects that do things in the world is, is multiply mediated. Awesome, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cesar. Hi, Warwick, good, good to see good. you. Yeah. See your uh, hand hello. up. Uh, yes, good to be here. I just flew in from Lisbon, so uh, I may, may not be making much sense. Um, uh, and also, I'm, I have to apologize in advance. I've got to go in about 10, 15 minutes to find a legal space for my car, which is parked uh, <laughs> illegally at the moment. Um, but, uh, <laughs> the hazards of living in, in a Sydney. Uh, but look, um, uh, a couple of things. I, I missed the very beginning, so you may have addressed this. Uh, I just wonder if you could say something about the readership for this, um, uh, for this essay. Um, and has it already been published or is it uh, about to be published? But uh, it says 2022, so I'm not quite sure. Um, you may have said that somewhere, but um, uh, so, the, the, I mean, I'm just interested in uh, uh, who reads this and why you pitched it in a certain way. Um, and so the other thing though, um, perhaps more substantively is the um, question of where does one stop? in a way, um, you're talking about um, the world making or building or whatever of um, viruses. And a moment ago, you talked about them as organisms. Uh, and so I just wonder, uh, you, as you know, I'm particularly interested in uh, prions, infectious proteins. Uh, so do you think proteins are world making and world building as well? And if proteins, what, what doesn't build worlds then? Uh, if ke chemicals are building worlds, I mean, I mean, what's the utility of the, of the concept of everything, everything, thing, not just organism, uh, does it? Yeah, so that uh, puzzles me. Super generative question work, and, and the first one's easy to answer. So um, it's it's written for a museum uh, catalog, the Milan Triennial catalog that's coming out next month. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I guess being read by the, the public who goes to museums. And, and the second question, this, this might actually have to be, uh, you know, uh, we might have to rewind the Zoom recording and see if I said organism. I, 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 I would... Um, I would think I was talking about the, the human organism and um, the virus, I, probably hedging my language a little bit as to whether or not the, the virus was uh, an organism or a lively process to, to think um, with John Dupre and Stefan Goodinger. Um, but you're, independent of whether or not we call a virus an organism, I, I think of an organism as something with a, a metabolism, something um, that uh, you know is able to respond um, to you know the world and and I think part of the um, careful accounting that Mary Ewell gives of, of the phage is of something that that responds you know responds to certain um, uh, receptor morphologies that responds to the lipid bilayer of of, uh, of a cell mem membrane that dances along the surface in, in her language. Um, but I, I, th I think your, your question is more fundamental about, um, you know, what kinds of things or beings uh, build worlds. And um, I, would, I would like to push hard against, to maybe clarify what I'm trying to say, I would like to push hard against um, Jane Bennett's ideas about vibrant matter. And this goes back to some conversations that we had when, when Stephanie gave, gave her paper and Jane, Jane, Jane was on the line. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in my mind, there is a, a phenomenological distinction between um, life and non-life. And, um, you know, in part, I'd like to draw that distinction um, also ethically, that, that there's, the, the, there's certain sorts of re relations and responsibilities that um, pertain to the realm of the living that, that I don't want to um, extend to the realm, uh, realm of, of non-life. Um, I gave a talk last week in um, uh, Finland, uh, engaging with my work on um, the speculative futures of, of China right now and, and juxtapose the biotech industry um, that has particular capitalized lively futures um, with images of dust and, and spreading clouds that are um, 
and this is in dialogue with Jerry Z's work, um, the, the kind of dust that's overwhelming the built environment in certain parts of China. And, and to think about, yeah, our, our ethical responsibilities towards the living as being different from um, the, the kinds of relations and responsibilities that we might have with, for example, dust. Um, that's, that's not to say... So no, I was just wondering, are you, are you saying that, because I mean, basically a virus is a piece of nucleic acid, right? Um, and uh, a protein can also infect people, change conformation of itself and other proteins in the body. So it's a process as well. Uh, and so why would you uh, preference nucleic acid over protein? Protein as a molecule is so much more interesting the nucleic acid. And so, um, yeah, so I'm just wondering, how do you make, I mean, can you make the distinction uh, at this level? That's what I'm, I mean, bacteria, because they've got a cell are easy, but once you get to viruses, why not proteins? Why not everything? So uh, first pushing back a little bit, viruses are more than nucleic acids. They're nucleic acids and proteins, right? So in, in part of the, the molecular intra-actions, so to kind of uh, mobilize Karen Barad here, that happen in, in cells. Um, and, you know, Sasha Sasha's the expert here who can kind of correct me if, if I misspeak. But, you, you know, part of the really interesting dynamics involve um, the transcription and the translation and the replication. So, so you know, the nucleic acids become enzymes that catalyze relations and reactions with themselves. But then the proteins that, that also uh, get translated from those nucleic acids then interrupt and interfere with different organelles in the cell. And, and the proteins, the viral proteins also interact with each other. They, um, you know, they, they form you know, uh, structures, but then also play a feedback role in, in the transcription and translation. So um, not to say, not that I want to um, say that um, proteins aren't interesting, that enzymes aren't interesting, that kinases aren't interesting, that proteases aren't interesting. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, and maybe this is where we could like in a careful kind of way, lean into the idea that a virus might be an organism. So if it's more than nucleic acid, if it's more than protein, if it's those things conjoined together and existing within an environment that you know is the host, the host plus broader ecologies, maybe we do want to lean into it and call it an organism and think about the specificities of organismic agency in contrast to say something that's more limited in its worlding capacity, like a protein, an enzyme that's restricted to a particular cell. Right. Rachel, do you want to call Thanks, everybody? I want to. So I want to actually check in with Melanie because Melanie had her hand up um, a little bit ago. Melanie, did you want to go? And then Astrid and then Cesar. Yes, yes. I think in the meantime, I thought I'm, I'm getting so confused and so inspired by all of this. I might not be able to ask my question. I also read the paper like at four o'clock in the morning. Um, but yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I, I loved reading it, especially because it looks like this like continuation of emergent ecologies. Like there's a lot of the, the old stuff, but it's also new stuff and it's very exciting. It also reminded me of, of um, John Roughgarden's um, Evolution's Rainbow and just like, again, like how the virus is just such a, such a more diverse story that doesn't fit into people's minds. And then one sentence that really stood out to me is your comment on how in recent years, cultural theorists haven't kept up with the scientific initiatives and there i mean i'm just curious what you think about why that is the case and as somebody who you know you're almost like you work in a transdisciplinary way um you know, you collaborate with sasha and all the scientists it's this ongoing conversations and then kind of you know playfully provocatively the, the piece is titled um virology um as in like it can be read as a piece about virology but it can as also be read as a piece of virology like pushing towards a more you know the humanities and the social sciences shouldn't be treated as separate because we very much need both to understand what is what is going on so i think more like a kind of like a future for future oriented question like what what are the the methods that that work like the methods the the kind of you know i don't know new categories that work to make sense of, of the moment. If we take COVID as this 
really big intervention, but I mean, I also love how you um, kind of like center around HIV and AIDS um, as a, as a, I mean, so, so much of the thinking, I think, and thinking kinds of collaborations that, that we, we apply to the pandemic now comes really out of the, the research and the activism and thinking around that, that previous, well, previous pandemic, still ongoing pandemic. Yeah, like rambling, rambling comment and question, <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. Well, first on, on the title, um, that title wasn't my own. It was foisted on me by, by the editor who wanted to come up with, uh, you know, a discipline for every chapter. So, so there was an earlier title uh, that had the virus sphere in it. And, and I credit Sa Sasha with, um, you know, attuning me to the virus sphere. Like in my earlier thinking, I was attuned to the virome, the human virome. And Sasha invited me to expand my imaginary and and you know, think think about the the totality of, of viruses, um, and yeah, as to why um, you know scholars right now in the social sciences and humanities are um, you know largely oriented towards older virological scholarship. I, I would also say that you know perhaps oriented towards um, yeah maybe the the dominant form of virology as it plays out in biomedical sciences that's less interested in. The natural history of, of um, uh, these agents and, and more just concerned with you know how, how it impacts human disease and death and you know the disease diseases of our crop plants and you know I, I, th I think it reflects you know the broad anthropocentric trends that um, permeate um, you know knowledge making practices and um, yeah I, I guess um, learning how to read and um, yeah, talk, talk, talk to um, not just the folks that are, you, you know, speaking to the New York Times or, you know, not just reading the popular science that, that comes out during a pandemic, but uh, engaging with primary literatures. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, I, I guess part of your question might be about methods and um, I've just been reading a lot. I mean, that's what this reading group has been all about is just, you know, reading things together and um, using a reading practice to also spark conversation that might expand beyond what gets printed in, in an article. Um, but yeah, I, I see everything in this piece as, as just a, a real uh, credit to the uh, virologists like Sasha and Forrest and Jeremy and many others who have been willing to have, have dialogues and point me towards the relevant literature. So. Yeah, I, I see this piece as, as a collection of, of many of the things that I've gleaned from, from people who've, who've come to the reading group. Astrid, you had your hand up, and then Cesar. Hello, everyone. Hi, Evan. I wanted to intervene and come back and piggyback on Robert's question for um, the, the previous discussion, the life and life distinction. And uh, as you, as you, uh, where I have been adopting uh, Elizabeth Pominelli's argument that the very distinction between life and non-life is the problem of our time, rather than making a decision whether viruses are organism or whether they are not organism, whether they're just a bunch of proteins. But she has been arguing that we have been focusing too much on this distinction, and that is our as big dilemma and ethical problem. So. Uh, and I wanted to hear what, what you're thinking in this regard, if you don't think this argument uh, has, uh, is important or whether you disagree with her on that account and uh, whether you do think this distinction is important and uh, needs to be made for specific reasons. So that's, that was my question. Yeah, so uh, we haven't gone there yet, me and Beth. <laughs> we kind of danced around that in, in the recent dialogue that we had at the Triennial in, in, in Milan. Um, and there, there is a recording of that that I'm going to try to uh, push the organizers to, to get out there in, in the world. Um, but yeah, so, so Beth's most recent book is called Between uh, uh, Gaia and Ground. And in there, she engages with, with Bateson um, and, and others to um, so, sort of go at that point that you just uh, made Astrid, but also some, some other ones. Um, there's, there's a longer version of this paper that kind of gets deeper into the Bateson and, and goes, you know, so Bateson draws the distinction between creatura and pleroma, building on Carl Jung and, and the Gnostics. And um, 
I think at my heart, <laughs> you know, at my core, I'm I'm a Batesonian through and through. And um, you know, Beth and I have many more conversations to have about this. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, if, if you kind of look classically at, at what Bateson um, was trying to tease out in, in, in these, these books and essays that, that he wrote through, through his life, um, kind of distinguishing <clears throat> mental systems um, from, uh, you know, other, other kinds of, of systems that tend towards chaos. And, and I know, Astrid, you're, you're someone who's super smart on this. I'm a little afraid to like tread into these waters you know, um, I'm thinking about Schrodinger's cat and Maxwell's demon and all these things that I don't pretend to know about in the domain of, of physics. But um, yeah, for me, there's there's something specific to um, the ways that certain kinds of of um, of, of of lively um, processes and and or organismal logics and mental systems. Um, are able to learn and acquire knowledge and learn. Bateson really emphasized the importance of learning about context. Um, so, so the kind of knowledge that pertains in a given situation, but then the limits of, of that knowledge that doesn't translate to other, other situations. So, so he, he drew this formal uh, analogy between, um, yeah, thinking things with, with the cognitive capacity of a mind and, um, the things that know and be and do um, uh, in, in more kind of ecological adaptationist um, being and becoming terms. So, you know, updating Bateson, kind of getting through, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that's come out since 1980 when Bateson passed away and, and trying to think the life, non-life distinction um, you know, built in a, in a way that builds on, on that tradition um, is a big task. <laughs> um, probably not something I can uh, unravel here and now, um, but I, I guess the short answer is that, yes, I still think that that distinction is an important one to make um, ontologically, phenomenologically, and ethically, and to be continued. So maybe you, me, and Beth should have a conversation about this someday. But maybe I, I would need someone else on my team if you and Beth can be on the one team. So I missed some of that because I, my connection is not so great. But thank you very much, Evan. We can maybe have another discussion in privacy process. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I should on that note um, uh, say that there's a new book from Ha Kei Wei in Berlin that just came out or is coming out like in the next few weeks on What is Life? That's the title of the collection. Stefan Helmreich has an essay in there. Uh, Sophia Rosuth has an essay in there. I, I haven't had the chance to get my hands on a copy yet, but um, you know, we, we, we could also read that and discuss together with Stefan and, and others. Um, Cesar, did you have a question? Yeah. You had your hand up before. Um, okay, Cesar and then Julieta. I just, well, it's, it's kind of pushing on the same thing. One was thinking of Hallowell and um, Ojiwe question of, okay, what is inert to start with? And they kind of flip the question, which I think is, is an interesting approach because often the, the question is, is as something added on rather than what does it do? And I find that, yeah, Amerindian thought is very interesting in that sense. It's always very pragmatic is, okay, what is doing what? Then what can you think about? Um, and that was also connecting me with something else that goes with what is life, uh, that essay by Schrodinger and his uh, Robert Rosen essays on life itself, which I think it would be really interesting to to bite again his notion of, of living beings as anticipatory beings. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking was. Could, could okay, I riff on that just, just really quick before you before you have another thought? And I want to hear the next thought. I I, I mean, I, I think we could engage with the virus as an anticipatory subject or being or thing in the sense that it's it's anticipating a receptor like it's 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 mode of embodiment as an agential being or thing is all about anticipating 
that jump into the next cell or the next body or the next species. It, it, you know, and, and maybe you know, those distinctions don't matter. Um, it, the, the, the jump between a cell and a body and, and you know, species, like the, the kinds of categories that we see in, uh, the, as you know, creatures with primate visions are probably like those, those categories are very different from, I would imagine, an embodied, if we can speak of it, uh, embodied viral subjectivity. But, but yeah, I, I think that anticipatory logic definitely would, I, I would argue, would holds in the realm of viruses. But um, go, go ahead with the second part of, of what you wanted to say or ask. So the, the second was kind of also pushing on kind of when, when we start thinking about viruses, even as, as living processes, we tend to push it as into the, in a reductionistic fashion, is my feeling. And I wonder whether it's also to be pushed in the other way around. So if you think, for example, of, of rabies, uh, there's already an emotion there. So, or when you think about uh, COVID, there is a, there's a social reaction, a political reaction, and, and the thing just takes a, a different dimension altogether, which is also, also the virus. So, um, yeah, uh, perhaps if, if that is something we can play with. Yeah, and, and I think there's, I mean, there's a real, um, so, so I find there's something really interesting going on in these viral worlds, you know, following Celia Lowe, who recognizes that this is all speculative work, whether, whether the speculation is like moving from the electron micrograph into the art artistic rendering of, you know, the, the viral structure or, or that speculative work is, is also in an anxious register, you know, those of us awaiting for the, the viral cloud or, you know, the cough that happens on the train that, that produces the, you know, in, interior experience of anxious an anticipation. Um, so maybe that's, yeah, I'll, I'll say there, but um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we're, we're, when we're talking about the viral, it's 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 a realm that 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 words really fail in, and where kind of all of our systems of representation, whether those are visual or, or linguistic, kind of break down in some interesting and important ways. Awesome. Thank you so much. Julieta, good to see you. So uh, yeah, I'm going to 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 try to look at this from a lens that I have mentioned to you before, Evan, which is the work of um, uh, Hans Jörg Reinberger and the idea of epistemic objects. Um, whereas I was writing the definition of epistemic objects right now, which are um, uh, those badly, this, an epistemic object would be that badly defined something that is the very target of a particular experimental research endeavor. It embodies, but in a way that can be experimentally handled, what one does not yet exactly know. And there is, it makes me think, of course, that kind of definition, which I have always used uh, towards art making and processes of research, also makes me think about, for example, the early HIV therapies that were, in a way, even more lethal than the disease itself. And, or uh, the exper experiments with radiation that were conducted uh, in the early 20th century, right? Like the, um, and like and this process, right, of defining something. And um, in the, I was interested in, on how um, Hans Jörg went about um, uh, updating the definition of epistemic objects. Uh, some some years ago, after we had a conversation, we have worked together for years. So. Um, the way that he updated it was by saying um, that epistemic things are also things that one could say that led something to be desired. And in that sense, there is a kind of like a drive to find before there is a moment of knowing, which is what would take something into the realm of what a technical object or something that you know all around 
is. And so, I mean, like I was like, I've, I've been trying, I've been using that to think about um, what we're talking about and the paper and the context of Triennale of uh, the unknown unknowns. And I'm thinking also about the, like this kind of like dance um, between fear and definition and invisible and how it is um, um, just, just running to Cesar talking, I kept thinking about, of course, there is a kind of like an ecology of the visible where everything else, everything that cannot be seen becomes somehow a subject of fear. And I was like, even think like, you know, going back to thinking about like spontaneous generation and like all those things that cannot be explained because they just can, can't simply be seen and they resist definition on the grounds of, um, of, of like their sheer, of like how we cannot understand their dimensions, their scale, their or their modes of representation. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I was just like trying to throw this into the conversation. Yeah, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, the virus as a Deleuzean desiring subject mm. and, and also the host or the receptor as an epistemic thing from the embodied subjectivity of a viral standpoint. Like if we could think about the situated knowledges of viruses for a second, you know, the things that they might know or anticipate about the world um, based on their embodied phenomenology, the morphology of their spike, if we're talking about a coronavirus, mm -hmm. or um, yeah, the, the conformational, and I'm going to mix up my words here, so I hope Sasha corrects me later, but you know, the ways that um, a virus is going to anticipate certain things, but you know, so much of, of the world, the universe, is unknown to to that you know very specific um, mode of being that only kind of unfurls into a lively process in very rare cases. Like most of the, as as I, I would imagine it, like most of the viruses that go out with a sneeze, you know, don't ever end up in any kind of happy, happy environment that's going to, you know, produce that. So, so what is, what is, if we're, if we're thinking about the epistemic object, not from a human standpoint, but from a viral standpoint, yeah, how, how might we refigure the realm of mm. unknown, unknowns, but also the, the realm of knowability? I, I mean, like that, that, you know, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting to think about like reverting um, this like sense of the desiring subject because like, of course, like the moment when you don't know or can't define and I mean, but you know, what you are saying is also the sense of, you know, there is this particular three day dance when your child sneezes on you and you are like up and sick now. And there are these three days of dread. And which I think is something that has permeated the, the last two years of life for most of us, right? Where we can count how many times we have been in a situation where somebody has sneezed. And I mean, you know, like I, I just keep thinking, you know, like that it's very easy to direct that. that I mean, like, are we afraid of the virus or are we afraid of each other? And I think that in that sense, it's a lot easier to, to pretend that we are afraid of the virus, right? Um, I mean, like in that sense, that, but I mean, I don't know, like the conditions of, I mean, like trying to use those lenses of like um, fear, love, desire, like, like a more effective lenses um, to address this thing that we don't know yet. And therefore it's, it's, you know, it's like in the same way that conspiracy theories have been built around like all the government lies because they are not, it's like, of course, they don't know, you know, like, I mean, it, it, it's easy to say they are lying to you, but they don't know there's no vaccine. There is like, like it's trial and error in that sense is reminiscent of, um, as I was mentioning, or, and, and as it also mentioned, like, like early um, HIV uh, therapies, like, like AIDS the cause of uh, plenty of death. So yeah. but the, the kind of like fear that gets built and the logic of, um, you know, um, 
top-down uh, ghosts and, and fans and are a lot more human than viral in that sense, if that makes sense. And I stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Julieta. Um, Sevgi, you had your hand up. Yes, I have an unstable internet connection. Let me see. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, it's, uh, what I want to ask actually is somehow related with um, the last discussion uh, about domestication of viruses, just uh, still on my mind when I was reading it. Because for me, uh, should we um, should we know the viruses in order to domesticate them? Because in the fermentation practices, ancient one, without knowing the all the species, people were domesticating them and were engaging with them. So I would like to ask you: Could you elaborate a little bit on them, or on this? What does mean domestication of viruses, and whether we should um, know? Uh, the specific uh, species in order to domesticate them. Thank you. So, so my answer is going to in part go back to um, some of the uh, my earlier musings on Lacan and sort of divided subjects. So um, Joe Dumit has uh, what he calls the microbiopolitical dictum. It, and that's basically never think that you know all of the species involved in a given decision. Um, never think that you speak for all of yourself. So kind of invoking the, the divided human subject, but also um, the kind of unknowability of a, of a given situation. Um, and I think with particular in respect to domestication, so, you know, the, the piece gestures towards, you know, work by Anna Singh and others, um, where uh, the conversation about domestication isn't just focused on um, the organism that the human seeks to op optimize or control or, or proliferate for food or, or otherwise, but to recenter um, the uh, kind of analysis on, um, you know, the human and, and maybe also the relationship to think about what, what has changed in, in the organism that the human seeks to dom domesticate, but also the ways that the, the organism um, induces changes in, into the host, um, you know, when thinking about a virus. Um, I, I've always found um, Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire, a, a really nice one to teach alongside, um, you know, the more abstract theoretical uh, work by Singh, um, you know, Timothy Mitchell and, and others who've tried to think about um, the ways that, you know, human agency is, is mediated by um, other, other forms of life. And yeah, and in, in domesticating a virus, so, you know, look, looking at HIV, for example. So Julieta talked about how early um, HIV therapies like AZT were really toxic, and you know, the poison. Uh, it was more, you know, in the logic of the pharmacon, it, it was kind of less less cure and more poison. And you know, gradually over the decades, and kind of in. Um, in these spaces of impure science where activists insisted in doing science differently, um, you know, gradually we've domesticated HIV. So in many parts of the world, um, Europe, um, China, uh, you know, the US, HIV is, is no longer a disease really. It's, it's, a, it's a manageable infection that doesn't result in a life expectancy that's much different from, um, you know, if you don't have the virus. So, so I, I think of domestication in those sorts of technological, but also social innovations that we might develop in the presence of a virus. And, you know, in the presence of SARS-CoV-2, uh, the, the virus that's entangled with uh, the disease, COVID-19, um, we, we see all sorts of social and technological innovations, whether that's relating to distancing or masking or, or vaccines or, you know, antiviral medicines. Um, so yeah, like the question becomes is, you know, how has SARS-CoV-2 transformed us? And, and I think, you know, we're just starting to articulate the ways that we've been transformed uh, by, by a pandemic. And, you know, some, some of those transformations are immunological, some of those transformations 
are in the realms of biocapital, are in the realms of um, the kinds of intellectual property that is formed and contested in a pandemic. Um, but yeah, I, I think kind of the, the ways that we've been domesticated by a virus are, are still, we're just still figuring it out. And, and, you know, we can think back to the early part of this conversation about the anthropos and the way that the Anthropocene was interrupted. Um, you know, in a certain sense, the, this, this virus has domesticated us and using that logic of kill the winners that, that um, you know, I articulated in the piece. Um, but, but again, I, I, I think as, as um, you know, we might think of a, a kind of retribution from a figure that we might name as, as Gaia, it is important again to emphasize that, you know, this, this figure is not the writer of wrongs. This is not, um, you know, reestablishing an era of, of justice and, and flourishing. It's, um, if anything, exacerbating inequalities and vulnerabilities that um, are, are visible align, along lines of race and class and national origin. Um, but, but, but I, yeah, I think in some ways, um, the virus has domesticated the virus. SARS-CoV-2 has domesticated Anthropos, or at least reminded Anthropos that um, it, it exists within some, some worldly constraints that it might have imagined itself to be liberated from. I, again, I, I don't think we should think of Anthropos as a unified subject, but um, yeah, the, the virus for me is diagnostic of, of some of these pathologies and in, in, in being and thinking. Um, Astrid. I just wanted to react really uh, quickly to what's other domestication issue and what Sefki just asked. And it's also Sefki who usually points out that there are really good microbes out there too. So there are good phages too. So I'm, I'm just thinking about phage therapy, right? The, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, which is coming back right now in, in the context of antimicrobial resistances that people are thinking of using phages in order to kill bacteria in our body. So that can be seen as a mode of domestication. However, I'm also thinking of my colleague, John Dupre, who keeps pointing out that viruses are processes. And you, if the, uh, domestication means stabilization, we are actually thinking of the wrong kind of thing here, right? So it's, uh, you can't, the thing with viruses and the, his push to think about it as processes that, um, Facial therapy is never gonna work if you can think of it kind of as a um, as a thing, as a stable thing that you can just apply. Viruses are constantly changing, right? So, and just the whole success of that uh, way depends on getting wrapping our head around that this is not something that that we can grasp at any moment in time, and then it holds still, and then we can apply it in order to heal us, right? So, so then. It is exactly the um, one of the, um, yeah, for me, most vivid way to think of a dynamism of a person that has actually medical application here that we uh, will never be able to, to use viruses in a, in a productive way if we keep thinking of it as a, as a specific thing rather than a process. And I'm just repeating on the previous argument, which I just heard again uh, sometime last week. So I just wanted to, to, to throw this in here. Maybe there is a way of domestication, but domestication cannot mean stabilization in a, in a, in a specific way. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I'd love in response to give a shout out to Victor, who's doing some important work on the history of, of, of phage. And um, we've also got a mini archive in the reading group. So we've had Jeremy Barr, uh, Forrest Roher, who are both doing um, you know, phage therapies in, in their own labs. But to respond to your idea about kind of things not sitting still in domesticated uh, arrangements, um, I, I would point to um, the idea of the new wild that, that uh, I credit to Sarah Franklin and that I also explored a little bit in emerging ecologies. So, so Sarah Franklin um, contrasts uh, this new for, form of wildness as, as emerging within realms of, of hyper cultivation and domestication. So if the previous distinctions were between you know, wild geese and domestic geese, um, 
she, she's looking towards biotechnology labs as, as sources of, of, of wild emergences of various sorts, wildness in the sense of something a little bit risky, potentially out of control, as in like a wild night out. And um, yeah, the, the story that I tell in Emerging Ecologies, um, in part back to that, that chytrid fungus that I was mentioning, there's evidence of a global pandemic lineage that came about as, as a result of promiscuous intermingling and um, you know, global markets. So new kinds of chytrids were brought together and um, yes, spawned a new lineage, lineage that, that, that went global. Um, uh, not in any kind of, you know, lab leak, nefarious bioweapon kind of way, but just um, it, it seems that, uh, yeah, in, in the pet trade, in, in the trade of um, live reptiles and amphibians, you know, uh, things, things were spawned that, that, you know, a new kind of wildness um, as, as a result of, you know, human, human attempts to take wildlife and, and domesticate and as, as pets. Um, we are running out of time. I could ramble on forever, <laughs> I'm sure. We could, we could have another 100 reading group meetings, but I'm gonna hand it back to our host. I, I, I know we're, we're at the hour. I kind of wanted to, to, to sort of uh, wrap this all up for today. And before I announce our, our uh, next July um, meeting, I just wanted to kind of go swing back to Warwick's uh, original question about readership and sort of bring it back to how you, how you tied up this essay for a, a readership, for a public attending the, the, the Milano Triennale. And, uh, and I wonder if you could just say something about the, um, I mean, what is the peril of, uh, of sort of not thinking about the importance of viruses as us, as you've sort of built up in this essay? What is the, you, you leave us with thinking about kind of uh, thinking like a symbiotic virus. That's what you leave for your public. So I just wonder, um, you know that that's that's what you wanted a broader a broader readership to to really think through in in attendance and in and and in engaging with this exhibit. So I just wonder if you could say um, uh, something about that as we as we wrap up for today. And and thanks everybody for a lovely dialogue. So so I think my soundbite for that, and I'll try to keep it as a brief soundbite, is that if you continue thinking that humans are exceptional you're going to be bit in the butt by a new surprising thing from the realm of the unknown unknowns. So, you know, if, if we just inhabit these little bubbles, our apartments or the, or the foam that Slaughter Dyke describes, um, yeah, we're, we're going to be continually disrupted by something from the beyond that's kind of, you know, outside of our, our everyday purview of perception and action. And you know, I, I think a lot of people have commented on, um, you know, we had the the the, the bat biologist, um, uh, Rodrigo Medellin from, from Mexico telling us that, okay, you thought the coronavirus pandemic was bad, like just wait a few years for global, global climate change to kind of catch up with you and bite you in the butt. And, um, you know, if you live in California, you know, fires or, or Australia, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, or, you know, in a flood zone somewhere, there's things from that realm of the beyond that we sort of know about, and we can make prediction, predictions, we can anticipate, um, we can have that anticipatory logic, um, but yeah, we don't quite know what's, what's coming. So, uh, yeah, it, and, and I guess maybe this piece is an attempt to, um, dwell with that uncertainty, that uncertainty about a precarious human existence um, in, in a way that's more attentive to the relationships that kind of structure the world, the, the known world and the unknown world. So uh, if we can reassemble our you know, systems of knowing and being and doing in, in ways that are more attentive to those relationships, I think we can all breathe a little easier. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us for our 101st session. Thank you to essay uh, to Evan for sharing this wonderful essay with us, and I can't wait to see the uh, see the um, exhibition itself. And 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 Evan, if you if if a video does become available of your panel dialogue with Julieta and, and Beth Bovinelli, please, we'll we'll we will direct people's attention to it um, via the via the reading group um, links. 
Um, next up, everyone, we've got um, uh, a reading uh, and dialogue with uh, Stephen Moldrum, who's at the um, University of Texas Medical Branch in Bioethics and Health Humanities, talking about monkeypox and thinking about some of the health assumptions um, of monkeypox within queer communities. Uh, so that's what we're looking uh, forward to next in July. Um, lovely to see everybody. And Evan, thanks again so much for sharing this, this work. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And thanks, everybody, for coming out. It's real, real nice to see such a, a, a huge audience today. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Sasha. Bye, bye, Evan.